All right, last time we looked at an example where we had a motor and this complex load had a real and an imaginary portion, okay, where we had a real power of 28.8 kilowatts, a reactive power of 57.6, with an apparent power of 64.4 kVA, and a power factor of 0.4473 lagging. And as we mentioned last time, if you have these kinds of numbers, the power company is going to charge you for having a power factor that's too low. In other words, you have too much Q, too much reactive power, because they need to make their generators bigger to supply that reactive power. So how do you deal with this? The answer is power factor correction. And the purpose of power factor correction is to lower the Q of your load. and thereby to increase the power factor. How do we do that? Well, it turns out it's a pretty simple process requiring one additional component. What we're going to do is we're going to add a capacitor across the motor in parallel with the motor. And we're going to call this CPFC. Where PFC stands for power factor correction capacitor. So what we're doing is we are adding this capacitor so that now the generator sees both the motor and the capacitor as a combined load. All right, so what is CPFC there for? Well, just this. What we want to do is we know that we have a Q, 57.6 kilobars, which is due to that inductor. We also know that capacitors have negative bars. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose CPFC such that the reactive power of that capacitor is equal to minus Q of the inductor. So in other words, if Q for the inductor is 57.6 kilobars, the reactive power of the capacitor will be equal to minus 57.6 kilobars. So we need to choose a value of capacitance such that the reactive power of the capacitor cancels out the reactive power of the inductor. Because remember, for any load, all of the, rea the, re the, the total reactive power is the sum of the individual reactive powers. So in this case, Q combined is this Q plus that Q. Let's let them cancel each other out. So in this case, my capacitor must have a value of minus 57.6 kilobars for its reactive power. And I can go through now and work backwards to calculate what that capacitance value needs to be. So I'm going to call this current IC. Now something I want to point out, this I that flows into the motor does not change the voltage across the motor is exactly the same. 
So adding this capacitor does not change Q and P for the motor one bit. All we're doing is now adding another reactive power component. So in this case, what we get is that for the inductor, pardon me, for the capacitor, SPFC must be equal to P times PFC plus JQPFC by definition. This is the complex power of that capacitor, except that P, the real power, is equal to zero by inspection. Therefore, this must be equal to zero minus J times 57.6 kVA. Okay, but what is this equal to? Well, this must be equal to the same, the same 120 volts as across the capacitor. Therefore, this must be equal to VAC times IC complex conjugate by definition. So in this case, IC complex conjugate will just be equal to minus J 57.6 times 10 to the third divided by 120 and that will be equal to minus J 480 amps RMS. And now I know that IC must therefore be equal to J times 480 amps RMS. I've got the current that's flowing through that inductor, pardon me, through that capacitor. And from here I know that the impedance of the capacitor, ZPFC, must therefore be equal to VAC divided by IC, right from the definition of impedance. So Z is equal to V over I, therefore this is equal to 120 divided by J480, and that will be equal to minus J 0 0.25 ohms. So, so far everything makes sense. I've got a negative impedance for a capacitor. That negative impedance will result in a reactive power of minus 557.6 kilovars across that 120 volt load. Now, from here I can calculate the capacitance because I also know that ZPFC must be equal to minus J over omega C PFC. Once again, definition of impedance. Well, what's omega? Well, if this is the United States or North America, then the frequency is equal to 60 hertz, and omega is equal to 2 pi times F. And so therefore, this will be equal to minus J over 120 pi times C PFC. And now I can take this, I can solve for C PFC, and what I get is that C PFC is equal to 10.61 millifarads. Okay, I now have a capacitor connected across that motor of a value 10.61 millifarads, and if I've done my calculations correctly, it is going to have a reactive power of minus 57.6 kilovars. Okay, let's do a couple more calculations here. What is the combined impedance of this capacitor in parallel with that motor? Let's go through and calculate that. Combined impedance is equal to ZPFC in parallel with Z motor, right? These are in parallel. So this is going to be equal to minus J0.25 
in parallel with 0 0.1 plus j 0 0.2, which will be equal to minus j 0 0.25 times 0 0.1 plus j 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.1 plus j 0 0.2 minus j 0 0.25. We plug that into the calculator and what we get is this is equal to 0 0.5 ohms. Now that's interesting. Z combined is now just equal to 0.5 ohms. In other words, it looks like a pure resistor to the power company. So as far as Nashville Electric is concerned, you've just got a half ohm resistor connected across to their power mains. What is the power of that resistance? Well, P combined is going to be equal to the effective voltage squared divided by 0.5. Once again, plugging in the numbers. In other words, 120 volts squared divided by 0.5, which is equal to 28.8 kilowatts. So the power doesn't change. The power of the motor is exactly the same. But now Q combined is equal to zero. There is no reactive power. So as far as the power company is concerned, you're not asking for any reactive power anymore. All, you re all you're requiring or all you're asking for them now is the real power, the power you're actually dissipating. So what's really going on in this circuit? And here's, here's a way to think about it. We've got an inductor and capacitor connected across the same load. Remember we mentioned before the positive and negative signs for reactive power indicate that when an inductor is charging up, a capacitor is discharging and vice versa. So when one is absorbing the energy, the other is releasing it. What's happening is the energy that was stored in the inductor gets pushed into the capacitor. Then the energy is pushed from the capacitor back into the inductor. So instead of drawing the power out of Nashville Electric's network and then pushing the energy back in again, all we're doing is the capacitor and the inductor are swapping it back and forth between themselves. So as far as NES is concerned, you're not asking to borrow any energy every half cycle. All you're paying for and all you're getting is just the 28.8 kilowatts. So in this case, the power factor is now equal to unity. Because as far as the electric company is concerned, you've got a purely resistive load. All right. And the apparent power if we look at the apparent power S combined, the magnitude, that's just going to be equal to 28.8 kVA because the power factor is equal to unity and therefore I have zero reactive power. So that means that the electric company can get by with smaller generators. The electric company likes this. So now they're not going to bill you for any excess Q because now you've added that capacitor. So you've actually got a couple of choices. You can add this capacitor yourself or the electric company will come to you and say, don't worry about it. We will provide the power factor compensation for you and they'll charge you for that but they'll charge you less money than they would if they were charging you, billing you for, uh, for low power factor. So you're still going to have to pay for the fee, the rental fee of the power factor correction, but it'll be less money than you'd be paying if your Q was too high. So in a nutshell, this is power factor correction. All right? Now, 
keep in mind, you'll always put the power factor correction capacitor in parallel with the load, not in series. You do not want to change the current or the Q or the P for the load. Everything must be connected across this load. So make sure this is always in parallel with that. Another thing to point out is I made an assumption here about a inductive load, an electric motor. What if I had a capacitive load? What if I had a load that looked like this? So if I had a load that looked like this where the capacitor, in this case I would have negative Q's for the load. So how would I do power factor correction for this to set it to zero? I would add a power factor correction inductor in parallel with a capacitive load. However, in the real world almost every big industrial load you see is going to be an inductive load. We are dealing with things like windings and motors and things like that, okay? Me electromechanical devices. You really don't see large factory scale capacitive loads. So if you did, you'd use a power factor correction inductor. You'd have positive QPFC canceling the negative Q load, reactive power of the load. But this is not really something you would see. This is what you actually see in the real world. You'll see these capacitors across it. All right? So, in a nutshell, that's how it works. You are simply canceling out the reactive power of the load with an equal but opposite reactive power in that capacitor. And you can simply work back and, you know, the way I've done it here, I've done it in such a way where you don't really have to memorize any equations, any complex equations. You're just kind of doing first principles. As long as you understand and remember how to do the complex power formula, you can just work backwards and then just use the definition of impedance and calculate what that capacitor needs to be. All right. So next time we'll look at a couple of more little subtle aspects of, uh, of, of power factor correction. And then finally we will finish off with just a couple of final comments on AC and complex power in general.